DNA moves in mysterious ways. There are now six billion people alive on the Earth. Our numbers are everywhere, carving and shaping the entire world. Most of us live in cities, which sprawl across the surface of the globe like vast circuit boards. The impact of our civilization is phenomenal. We have stamped our presence in steel, concrete, affluence and effluence. Cities beguile us with their splendor. Information bombards us at every turn. It's easy to lose yourself in a city. Buildings soar to the sky and amaze us with their architectural finesse. The holy grail of city-based consumerism is the automobile. Worldwide we drive 600 million of them, often in a congested frenzy. That many cars have three seats empty is beside the point. Consumer freedom is the name of the game here. Like our cars, City life can be slick and fully automated. We have no time to hang around. We have places to go and people to see. The march of human progress seems unstoppable. Cities continually expand as more and more of the natural environment is converted into civilization. We are committed to continuous growth and expansion. Meanwhile, the rest of organic life strives to survive as best it can. We may be oblivious to other organisms such as plants, finding man-made structures far more intriguing. And yet if this urban tree had been crafted by human hand, it would doubtless be lauded as a fine work of art. But since it is but a tree crafted by nature, we simply walk on by. Perhaps we forget that trees and plants make the very air that we breathe. Perhaps we forget that our lives depend upon the biological intelligence, like photosynthesis, evinced by other organisms. Perhaps then, it's time we city dwellers began to reacquaint ourselves with nature. It's probably fair to say that a growing number of people feel disaffected with modern life. It's a bit like that movie The Matrix. There's a kind of nagging suspicion that there's something fundamentally wrong with human culture, that we've missed something, that modern values don't really lead anywhere. Maybe we've been holed up in cities for too long and this is the cause of our unease. Or maybe the cult of consumerism has had its day and we're looking for a new set of values and aspirations. Or maybe it's simply that modern science and religion have failed to imbue our lives with real meaning. Maybe though the root cause of our ills lies in our relationship to nature. And by nature, I mean the biosphere in which we're embedded. Whereas our ancestors lived in close proximity to the earth, both physically and spiritually, modern life, city life, seals us away from the, the rest of the biosphere. We end up viewing the biosphere primarily as a set of resources to be exploited as much as we can and for as long as we can. Maybe it's this kind of attitude towards life on Earth 
that we take it for granted and act in often in ecologically destructive ways. Maybe it's this that lies at the heart of the spiritual malaise that many of us feel. It's possible, probable even, that science has come up with a misguided interpretation of nature, a misguided interpretation which fosters, or at least implicitly encourages, ecological insensitivity. After all, science teaches us that nature is essentially a meaningless accident. The ultimate explanation for the universe is that it sprang out of nothing and for no reason. Yeah, as Terence McKenna said, if you can believe that, you can believe anything. But it might be better to view nature as an intelligent system. This would mean that evolution could be viewed as the way that this intelligent system expresses its creative potential over time. After all, the most complex things in the known universe are organisms. Where did organisms come from? They evolved. Therefore, the notion that nature is an intelligent system is a sound idea. At the, at the least, it's a, an idea worthy of debate. At the most, it may signal a healthy paradigm shift. In fact, if Mother Nature is indeed replete with wisdom and intelligence, then she ought to provide us with an antidote with which to combat our ecological destructiveness, a kind of strong medicine that can instill within us a profound ecological awareness. And Mother Nature does provide such an antidote. Appropriately enough, it grows in the ground. Fungi are perhaps the most earthy of organisms. They can appear in many strange shapes and colours. The bulk of their body lies under the ground or inside dead wood and consists of a network of mycelial threads. What we commonly call mushrooms are the fruiting structures of fungi, which burst into the open air in order to distribute their spores. Unlike plants, fungi do not photosynthesize, but make their living breaking down dead wood, bark, and other organic detritus. In this way, fungi help to release essential minerals like phosphorus back into biospherical circulation. Despite dwindling habitats, there is one kind of fungus which has managed to thrive by the wayside. Its properties can only be described as extraordinary. This is our antidote, the psilocybin mushroom, of which there are roughly 100 species worldwide. Psilocybin is the name of the alkaloid within the mushroom which, in conjunction with the human cortex, can induce a powerful and life-changing spiritual experience. For this reason, psilocybin is nowadays classified as entheogenic, that is, a substance able to temporarily sanctify the human psyche. Psychoactive mushrooms of one kind or another have long held a place in folklore and literature. In Alice in Wonderland, for example, Alice eats a mushroom in order to change size. But our psilocybin story concerns the legacy of this man, Gordon Wasson. Having spent 30 years investigating the cultural use of mushrooms, Wasson travelled to Mexico in 1955 to learn more about the sacred mushroom ceremonies reportedly occurring there. Wasson had to seek the aid of a shaman, for it is the shaman who, traditionally, holds knowledge of entheogenic plants. Under the guidance of a shaman named Maria Sabina, Wasson became the first European on record to consume psilocybin, an auspicious occasion to say the least. Wasson was so amazed by the visionary effects of the Mexican mushroom that he went on to write a popular article about his experiences, 
thereby informing the world of this strange new natural resource. Subsequently, samples of the mushroom were grown in the laboratory. The active ingredient was isolated and thence named. The writer Aldous Huxley also experienced psilocybin and wrote of its virtues. In his last book, a utopian novel entitled Island, a sacred mushroom known as Moksha medicine is employed as a sacrament, and yet Huxley never realised just how widespread his beloved Moksha medicine was, that it was not restricted to Mexico, but was to be found growing throughout the very island of his birth. This is the kind of idyllic habitat which the European psilocybin mushroom favours, the lake district in the heart of the British Isles, the kind of mystical landscape conjured up in Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. It is here in the wild meadows and pristine green valleys, and alongside the paths walked by Wordsworth, that psilocybin mushrooms can be found. Diminutive and half-hidden, overlooked by most visitors, the entheogenic mushroom is part of one of Mother Nature's more undercover operations, a gift of healing and transcendence delivered through stealth. Historically, psilocybin mushroom use has been associated with the spectacular Mayan and Aztec civilizations in and around Mexico. These Mayan relics, for instance, known as mushroom stones, are thought to indicate the Maya's reverence for psilocybin. South of Mexico, in Colombia, native cultures crafted numerous gold statues adorned with strange circular motifs. On the back of this statue, however, are some thin stems which confirm that psilocybin mushrooms are represented. Likewise, in ancient India, hundreds of religious hymns were dedicated to Soma, a divine plant without root or leaf. Many Vedic scholars now believe that the legendary Soma was an entheogenic mushroom of some kind. And what of this, the Festos disc? Unearthed in Crete, the mysterious disc is believed to be a religious artefact dating back to 1700 BC. It is imprinted with various images. Actually, it is the oldest example of printing ever found. The various icons stamped into its surface have yet to be deciphered. One side of the disc bears images with an uncanny resemblance to European psilocybin mushrooms. Even the stem is pictured. As yet, however, Historians have failed to acknowledge and to investigate this compelling resemblance. Despite their illustrious role as a sacrament, psilocybin fungi remain illegal in many parts of the world. In America, for example, whilst it is legal to possess a loaded gun, it is illegal to possess the mushroom. In Britain and many parts of Europe, the mushroom has escaped prohibition as long as it is not processed in any way. However, since poisonous mushrooms may be picked by mistake by an interested seeker, psilocybin fungi have understandably remained on the periphery of culture. They are truly a thing of the wild and do not lend themselves to mass market consumerism. Yet the incredible psychological effects of this mushroom demand our attention. It's as if we had spent our lives holed up in a dark cave and were being cajoled outside in order to get a better perspective on the meaning of life. So what's it actually like to step outside the confines of conventionally perceived reality? To answer this, we must now venture to the very heart of the psilocybin experience. It begins, as with all significant voyages, with feelings of trepidation. Once the journey is commenced, there is no going back. To consume psilocybin is to consume the truth, and one must be prepared to accept all that follows in the wake of the sacramental act. As the effects proceed, there may be a short period of mild disorientation. Body and soul are forcibly swept to a new dimension more real than ordinary reality. On the way, cultural conditioning is shed like old skin. Traditional modes of cognition and perception give way to an entirely novel form of consciousness. As feelings of disorientation pass, it seems as if one's nervous system has been retuned. It's like waking up or even being reborn. One eventually arrives at a state of mind so enhanced, so coherent, 
that the interconnectedness of all things becomes breathtakingly apparent. With eyes wide open, everything radiates fractal beauty. One is reminded of Tibetan mandalas, geometrical Islamic artwork, and the interwoven design so prominent in Celtic art. With eyes closed, colourful visions unfold, so complex and so laden with intent as to suggest communion with a transcendental intelligence. As the journey continues, there is a tremendous feeling of being empowered, of being privy to the miracle of the living moment. Profound insights flow through the opened mind. Conscious existence seems more like a precious gift than a side effect of brain activity, a gift granted by a deliberately and exquisitely configured universe. One is thrust deeper and deeper into the mystery of being. As the entheogenic action of psilocybin reaches its peak, sacred realms of experience become accessible, and of this little can be conveyed in words. We are not alone and isolated. Nothing is isolated. We are each a uniquely evolving pattern of energy and information, born within a vast system of purposeful intelligence, which we call nature. Psilocybin fungi are far too controversial and too wild to ever become a popular part of the human diet. Nonetheless, the ecological message conveyed by psilocybin is worthy of our attention regardless of how one personally judges such a substance. And the message is quite simply this. If the great swathe of humanity spread across this planet is to maintain health and prosperity, then we simply must regain a right relationship with nature. And to do this requires, at least in part, that we begin to acknowledge the intelligence within nature. Nature is not some dumb and mindless thing. It is rather a distributed form of self-organizing intelligence. Human intelligence, on the other hand, might be impressive, but it's not in the same league as the intelligence of nature. We may, for example, tinker with DNA, but we did not design DNA. We may juggle genes and chromosomes, but we did not invent them. We may even destroy entire ecosystems for our own ends, yet we cannot rebuild those ecosystems. So rather than uh, dominate nature into subservience, we would do better to harmonize our behavior with the greater natural systems of which we are a part. Acknowledging the intelligence of nature is one step in such a green endeavor. The universe has order written all over it, from the orderly formation of spiral galaxies to the orderly behavior of atoms and molecules. So too do ecosystems and organisms behave in a sensible and orderly fashion. It is we belligerent primates who are firmly out of order with our excessive pollution and our almost psychotic obsession with material consumption. Something has to change because we can't go on bending the biosphere indefinitely. Something has to change. So why don't we slow down and look again with new eyes at this fantastic planet on which we live. Maybe, maybe we never left Eden after all. Maybe it was a kind of self-enforced exile. It 
it is indeed a fantastic planet, the Philippines for example. vision of paradise, a perfect day, infinite blue sky, crystal clear water. Huts nestle unobtrusively in the jungle, looking rather like giant mushrooms. The oceans here are teeming with life in all shapes and sizes. I named this strange fellow the toadfish. Its Latin name probably has less of a ring to it. An inventive crustacean, faithfully obeying the instructions on the container for external use only. And the real star of the show, our brilliant sun, powering the biosphere from a distance of 90 million miles. Travel, they say, broadens the mind. It certainly makes us aware of the diversity of the Earth's living surface. Filipino people might lack mobile phones and other forms of material wealth, yet they seem more relaxed, more free of stress, and more friendly than city people in the West. America America, the ancient continent, is bigger and more formidable than America the modern idea. It is a vast and spectacular landscape. The concept of deep time comes to mind, the realization that the Earth's surface has been subject to constant change for some four and a half billion years. Yosemite National Park. There are no shopping centers here, no banks, no skyscrapers, no billboards, just nature pure and simple. The giant redwood tree, one of the world's largest organisms, a staggering expression of DNA.
Australia, another inspirational continent, another taste of Eden. As an environment or land, Australia has a long history of being revered. There's nothing like a walk in a Queensland rainforest to shake off the city. You are surrounded by a compact web of organisms, all feeding back upon one another in sensible ways. The result is a healthy and self-balancing ecosystem, the very essence of what the biosphere is all about. You get a real sense of the plasticity of organic life, the way it flexes and feels its way around, interweaving and interlocking. More exquisite expressions of DNA, from the angelic and the sublime, to the cuddly and sleepy. And look at this astonishing bird, the cassowary, whose ancestors were likely to have been dinosaurs. How does it manage to generate those iridescent colours on its neck? Somehow, its DNA has learnt to synthesise them from the fruit that it eats. Could we really imagine a clever chemist performing the same trick? Through the process of transpiration, rainforests manage to create their own local weather systems, ensuring that water is constantly being recycled betwixt land and sky. Destroying a rainforest interrupts the cycle and can leave a landscape dry and devastated. For some reason, this knowledge seems lost on many developers. Is it really feasible to sell a large legacy of integrated biological wisdom? Fiji, in the South Pacific, gives us another glimpse of what the biosphere looks like when it has not been plundered and overridden by human civilization. The isolated beaches in Fiji are dangerous. There are coral reefs out there which can astonish a man to death. Apart from the usual array of plastic bottles which are washed ashore, the beaches are strewn with seeds, shed by plants which have learned, through evolution, to use the ocean as an effective means of seed dispersal. Each seed is like a computer program, written in digital DNA, sealed in a buoyant and protective packet, and delivered far and wide. It's a fine example of natural intelligence at work. Paradise would not be paradise were it not for natural intelligence. Uh, the reason life is such a sensibly 
coordinated phenomenon is precisely because life is woven from natural intelligence. This is one of the things which psilocybin seems to make very clear. Biological science also reveals the intelligence within life, only most biologists tend to overlook it. What we call DNA can be said to represent natural intelligence in a compressed and encoded form. Um, the natural intelligence within the DNA of this giant redwood tree pine cone, for example, is what can transform these small individual seeds into the largest trees on the planet. There is information in here on cell reproduction, differential cell function. There's information on how to build roots, shoots and protective bark. There's information on how to uh, construct pine needles with their ability to photosynthesize. There's information on how to store and distribute energy for thousands of years, which is how long redwood trees can live for. There's information on how to fight off infections, information on how to transport water from the ground up to a distance of 250 feet or more, um, even information on how to make more of these pine cones. It's all very clever stuff. Um, some botanists will spend their entire careers learning about the biological wisdom accumulated by just this one species. And yet for some strange and peculiar reason, natural intelligence remains completely and utterly unacknowledged by science. On the other hand, we've all heard of artificial intelligence, clever robots, smart computer systems, that kind of thing. Yet natural intelligence is precisely the thing that artificial intelligence seeks to mimic. Organisms can be considered expressions of natural intelligence, wired together with protein and amino acids, just as a clever robot is an expression of artificial intelligence, wired together with silicon and copper wire. Take this ant, for example. Its complement of biologic, honed, refined and hardwired through millions of years of evolution, is palpably intelligent. Ants can metabolize, respire, reproduce, locate food, build communal nests and learn about new terrains. They can even communicate with one another in a chemical language. In other words, everything about their biological and behavioral makeup is sensible and intelligent to a certain degree. If this were not so, they would not be fit and would not exist. In a real way, ants, like other insects, are small sophisticated machines engineered by nature with the use of molecular DNA. Beetles, a fine and rightly acclaimed group, but still overlooked by those who are not of an entomological persuasion. Imagine that this beetle had been cunningly designed by a team of artificial intelligence engineers working at the prestigious Massachusetts Institute for Technology. It would be acclaimed by the world. The public would be deeply impressed by man's capacity to craft such a machine. And yet since it is but a biological beetle constructed by nature, we don't give it a second glance. But if we look at insects as if for the first time, we see not mindless contraptions hacked together by chance, but intelligently built systems which, through the selective and sculpting power of nature, have evolved a kind of futuristic complexity. Flying is not to be sniffed at either. After all, it took our species more than 100,000 years to work out the aerodynamic equations necessary for heavier-than-air flight. Insects take to the air with ease. Bees are such consummate flyers that some species can attain speeds of 45 miles per hour. Weight for weight, they can produce the same power output as an aircraft piston engine and can fly 2 million miles per gallon of honey. Some insects can even walk on water. That is no small miracle by anyone's standards. It will be a long time before the artificial intelligence community can match this kind of engineering finesse. And as for dragonflies, well, their visual systems are so perfected that they can see through 360 degrees and somehow process all the information at once. It's another example of the natural intelligence encoded within the dragonfly genome.
there are seemingly no limits to what natural intelligence can achieve in the biological domain. Before they metamorphosize, many insect larvae spin themselves cocoons fashioned from silk. In terms of weight, silk is stronger than steel. The spinneret mechanism within the larvae, through which protein molecules are carefully arranged so as to form and distribute silk, can only really be appreciated as an instance of natural intelligence. So too do the larvae's acrobatic talents indicate the intelligence hardwired into its DNA. Metamorphosis is remarkable. It demonstrates the sheer transformative power of DNA. To reorchestrate this precise arrangement of one billion cells into this precise arrangement. If one encounters a butterfly whilst under the influence of psilocybin, it can be an almost mythical event. Futuristic machines is an understatement. And yet conventional science teaches us that these organisms are no more than the outcome of a blind and utterly non-intelligent process. A disservice, I fear. Ingenious expressions of natural intelligence at least comes closer to the mark. Unfortunately, global warming is endangering these delicate miracles. One quarter of Britain's native butterfly species, for instance, face extinction in the next 100 years due to warmer temperatures. Those species who inhabit mountainous regions are steadily moving higher to avoid increasing temperatures. Worldwide, the natural environment which supports such life is being steadily eroded. It's a shame that we do not perceive the real nature of the life forms which we inadvertently destroy. The plant kingdom is also worth a reappraisal. The entire web of life, ourselves included, depends upon a fundamental example of natural intelligence embodied by our botanical friends here, namely photosynthesis, the process through which sunlight is converted into metabolic energy. All plant species perform this feat regardless of what morphological form they take. Photosynthesis represents the tree of life's primary technology, a technology learned through evolution. As natural technologies go, photosynthesis is highly advanced. It is hard to get your head around what a photon of light actually is, let alone imagine how to capture one and borrow its energy. Yet plants do just this by making use of chlorophyll and an array of advanced nanotechnological machinery. Leaves are the structures which carry out photosynthesis. They are nature's solar panels, ensuring that the biosphere remains plugged in. Apart from performing photosynthesis, leaves can also serve as protection. The Venus flytrap has gone further and has evolved leaves which can capture and eat insects, a notion that was originally rejected by 19th century botanists as being far too outrageous to be true. Other plants, like the pitcher plant, have evolved jug-shaped leaves which fill with water and which can drown any insects gullible enough to venture inside. Like the Venus flytrap, the plant eventually consumes its insectile prey. It is somewhat odd, then, that we will not generally perceive a leaf as embodying intelligent design, whereas we clearly perceive intelligent design in a piece of litter. The young Charles Darwin had keen eyes. To view life and its evolution as a naturally intelligent process does not require us to abandon Darwin's great vision. With our growing knowledge of DNA and genetics, Darwin's work continues to be vindicated. However, how we interpret evolution is another matter. The chief virtue of psilocybin is that it reveals the intelligence and creativity at the heart of the evolutionary process which Darwin glimpsed. These days, no reasonable person can dismiss evolution out of hand. Take a close look at the flipper on this seal. 
there are finger bones underneath. This seal's ancestors were creatures of the land. Gradually, over millions of years, its genes have been shaped by natural selection so as to express a body more adapted to life in the ocean. At this point in time, the seal is a land mammal wearing its own tailor-made wetsuit. The same evolutionary transformation, but in reverse, can be seen in this snail. Snails are mollusks, and most mollusks live in the ocean, which is why we find shells on the beach. For whatever reason, the ancestral lineage of this snail left the ocean and became adapted to life on land. Like the seal, its genes and its biological form reveal its evolutionary history. Go back far enough in time and our own ancestors were likely to have been amphibians of some kind, maybe like this salamander. Amphibians go through one stage of their lives with gills. The human fetus also passes through a gilled stage during its development. This clearly demonstrates our own evolutionary history. Our closest living relatives are other primates who share much of our own DNA. Human DNA codes for a bigger brain than other primates. The problem is, we have now elevated our big brains above all else. We think we are smarter than nature. Design, purpose and creativity are capabilities ascribed only to ourselves. And yet seals, snails, salamanders, monkeys and any other creature you care to mention are, biologically speaking, impressively designed. Thus, we must admit that design, purpose and creative engineering are all properties of evolution, a process which preceded our own ability to design and to create. Given that evolution builds up complex and eminently sensible biological structures, demonstrates that evolution is essentially a learning process and not dumb and mindless as science teaches us. Through evolution, nature authors intelligent solutions to the problems of living. Instead of books, the intelligent solutions are transcribed in DNA. And since DNA is mutable, improvements and re-editing can always be achieved. DNA that is senseless is terminated, whereas DNA which makes more sense is favoured or selected. If organisms and their environment are considered as a totality or continuum, then nature is clearly a wonderful system of self-organising intelligence. It's also worth bearing in mind, of course, that the original formation of DNA and its progressive evolution are written into the very laws of nature. The universe is quite literally a life support system, even a consciousness supporting system. These are facts with many profound implications. We are so in love with our own intelligence that we confer prestigious awards upon those who discover the intelligence within nature. James Watson and Francis Crick, for example, are revered to this day for their discovery of the exquisite double helix structure of DNA. Nature, on the other hand, received no accolade whatsoever, despite teaching Watson and Crick all that they knew. In a similar way, we are more likely to be impressed by shiny biotechnological machines that can chop and change DNA than we are with the biotechnological properties of DNA itself. And so as ever, natural intelligence remains unsung. Most of my psilocybin journeys have been out in the wilds of the Lake District in Snowdonia where the mushroom tends to grow during the autumn. Locating and consuming them always feels like an involvement in some kind of subtle organic alchemy. Psilocybin is recognised by the human cortex and integrated into its neuronal architecture. The result is a kind of retuning after which information broadcast from some otherwise occluded source becomes suddenly very much accessible. Nature then becomes like a wise teacher. And it was this intimate bonding with nature and the overwhelming impression that nature is more alive, more precious and more mysterious than we think that inspired this film. And although the mushroom is certainly not for everyone, the deep ecological awareness which it can convey is for everyone. It is the message which counts. In my opinion then, to really get a sense of natural intelligence, to really feel it, requires that we find the time to 
take leave of the city and visit those pristine areas of wilderness which still remain on this turbulent planet. For it is only by immersing yourself in nature that you can really begin to sense its true value. And so I will leave you with a walk on the wild side here in the UK. It's time we all rediscovered our roots.